give you praise this morning. We thank you. Cause every one of us to be brought under the spotlight of your spirit check so that our hearts will be placed on the spot and that you purify our hearts and bring us into alignment. Do a quick walk this morning and let your great name be glorified. In Jesus' name. Please, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Now, how many of us conducted the exercise yesterday? The heart check exercise. You know, there was a statement that Jesus made to his disciples. Jesus said, say you are clean because of the words that I've spoken unto you. And I was wondering what kind of cleansing was that? You are clean because of the words I've spoken unto you. That was the scripture that actually I wanted to understand. And um, Another scripture I wanted to understand was why Jesus, what was the significance of Jesus having to wash the feet of the apostles? Yes, I understand that it was an example of servitude. That in the kingdom, service is greatness. I, I captured that. But over and above that, why was it that it was the feet he had to wash? Yes, we also understand that there's a cultural perspective to what Jesus did. Because the nation of Israel is in the desert, and if you walk around, your feet will become dusty. And the need for your feet to be washed is there. Okay? So I understand that there's a cultural perspective to that scripture. But if we probe it a little further, the feet happens to be the part of the body that touches the ground when you walk around. It makes contact with the visible world. And Jesus, in his cleansing exercise, was trying to do something that will clean them from their contact with the system their contact with with a system that is anti-God. You see, it has not occurred to us that we are pilgrims. And though we find ourselves in this world, we are not of this world. And as you go around your normal business, daily business, you are going to actually make contact with this world in such a way that many times will truncate your connect with God. I need to explain that. Many years ago, I was staying with my uncle in the city of Kano. And I was hearing his prayer as he was praying in the night to prepare to go to work. He happened to be a policeman. And as he prayed that morning, prayed, 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 then he said, the principality in this area, I bind you. And all of that. At least I remember that aspect of it. He came back that day, battered. Because he had had some confrontation from his superior in the office. And some terrible things have happened. Then when he was sharing the experience, I knew that it was a prayer he uttered in the morning. He had forgotten. But it was a challenge that morning. And the challenge, his utterance that morning, we saw the effect in the evening. And because of the battle that he fought, because he was not conscious of the utterances he made in the morning, 
when he was confronted with a battle that was a function of his utterance, because of the disconnect between him and the things he said, he was not able to respond in the spirit of what he said, with the understanding of what he said. So he yielded to anger, yielded to many things and bitterness and came back in that state. See, he had made contact with the world and he had come back with defilement. If he's going to access the spirit realm in that state of bitterness and anguish of heart, he will find the problem contacting God. Are you still with me? <laughs> so Jesus, when he washed the apostles' feet, the insight I got from there, apart from the obvious in that scripture, is that once and again we need to do some checks on our heart. To, to, we need to be clean. We need to subject ourselves to the washing of water so that the impact of the world we can shelve it out and then continue our assignment and our journey as pilgrims upon the face of the earth. Now, for those of us that there are few of us that do office work. Mommy, have you ever, maybe you were in a time of fast, you did like three days, you are concentrating, seeking the face of God, and suddenly you now went to the office and some events now took place that were actually orchestrated to offend you. Has it ever happened to you before? It happens to me many times. When I'm beginning to get serious and I want to achieve alignment, the devil goes in, in the, through the circumstances to get me to operate in the flesh and cut me off so that some form of disconnect can be achieved. And Jesus, when we come back, he wants to wash us so that we are fresh again, so that we can make contact again, and so that we can continue again. And so there needs to be that constant heart check. If you are going to continue to be a sincere and accurate Christian, you must subject yourself to this heart check regularly. If not, you become wicked without knowing. You speak in tongues but you are a wicked man. Because several things are built up in your heart that you have accepted and accommodated, you are protecting it. Meanwhile, it's hanging on your flesh and your willingness to submit to the sovereignty of God. Are you still with me now? Hallelujah. Now, so we need to do this hard check thing regularly. There are times that I know because of the state of my heart, I cannot preach. So, it doesn't matter who preaches and how he does the preaching. It's God's business. Before I became a preacher, I was born again. And I was okay with God. Then he now said, we should come and start preaching. <laughs> so I maintained the first contract. That's what matters. Because I will leave this world, the ministry will still continue. But my relationship with God that began before the ministry started, I need, it's going to determine so many things. So I can't even allow ministry to affect it. Hallelujah. Heart check. That's all I have. All I have is my... Relationship with God, my connection with God. And it is because of that connection that several things begin to break out. So I must value my connection with God. I must value what God wants to draw me into. And God's contact point is the heart. And it happens to be that the extent to which I will profit from the operations of Christ in my life is dependent upon the attitude that is sustained upon my heart. Circumstances and situations can creep in and actually um, influence your heart in such a way. Let me explain. Now, you see, if the devil has to attack you, he has to use people. He will not fly into your house. And uh, if he's going to use people, it's obvious that we use people that are within your vicinity. And the guys that are almost often, almost always within your vicinity are people that you are close to, happens to be. Your wife, your brothers, your close pals. It comes from those angles. Hallelujah. And there was a long stretch of time that some people in my house felt that 
they were called to control the outcome of my life. That was what they felt they were called to do. To control me. Where, what I will be involved with, where I will go and all of that. And right from time, I've always been a freedom fighter. So I would take it as a battle, an attack, if somebody wants to control me. Now, all the attempts that these people made to control me, they would go and have a meeting. I don't want to go into details. Have a meeting, decide. I say, ah, why is this guy not... Meanwhile, I had strict instructions from God for 10 years to do a particular thing consistently, which was contrary to what they wanted. But the people involved, the people that they were using, my elder ones, because some of us were not privileged to be born, first born, or well, I, I just had the, you know. So these guys did the things that they did, and somehow bitterness was growing in my heart. And the bitterness I'm talking about is not six months bitterness. I mean, real long bitterness. Now, anytime I pressed into the realm of God, I did fasting, I did prayers. My prayers and fasting did not yield so much. Yes, my spirit was charged. I felt, you know, a few impartations here and there. But my prayer and fasting didn't yield so much because there was bitterness combating the ground. Meanwhile, the bitterness built up, it began through natural circumstance, powered by the devil. He powered those natural circumstances and I became a victim to the things that he powered because my response to the circumstances was in the flesh. You see, as long as I wanted to respond in the flesh, bitterness found a foothold on my heart and that foothold of bitterness was an obstruction to my ascendancy. I did not know for a long time because I was praying, I was doing night vigil those days. Every day, I did it for months. But my entrance was hindered. My ability to hear the voice of God was hindered. It was bitterness that had taken me. But you will not know on the surface, you will not know when I stand on the pulpit to preach that bitterness had a foothold on the inside because of what I noticed that the elder ones in my family wanted to do, which I was opposed to. Whereas, when they start doing the things that they want to do, I don't say anything. I just keep quiet. I just keep quiet. I don't say anything. But it was affecting me. That was where I now learned. The Holy Spirit now taught me. Because I knew I was not gaining access. I was not gaining as much ascendancy as I desired to gain. And the Holy Spirit had mercy on me and just wanted to instruct me. And then taught, he quickened the scripture into me. He said, casting all your cares upon him because he cared for you. It was in that season that the Holy Spirit taught me how to cast my cares on him. And I found out that in the process of casting all your cares upon him, it is actually not God's responsibility, it's your responsibility. For six months I had bitterness in my heart, but it was my responsibility to cast my cares upon him. But I did not know that, and I did not even know how so to do. Then the Holy Spirit began to teach me how to cast my cares upon him. At that point in time, my care was bitterness. So he said that I should mention the person that I hate so badly on the strength of that weak bitterness and say, I love you. That's in my prayer. Not that the person is physically present. Then I found out how difficult it is. I said, alright, okay, you know you are a God of all power and all wisdom. So give me another option. I don't like this. Now, that person that wants to gain access into God's presence, and God looks upon you and identifies you from the standpoint of your heart. Meanwhile, the devil has been able to smuggle something into that heart that you are trying to protect. And because of your willingness to protect that which the devil has smuggled in, 
you are going to have to be denied some access into God's economy. Now, you see, the things I'm telling you now are, are actually the is actually the sum total of my spiritual experience in a whole calendar year. I wasted six of the months of that year in bitterness. Meanwhile, I was doing strong fasting and strong prayers, but there was no alignment. All right? Then I, the Holy Spirit refused to change the recipe. So I will call the person's name and I will say, I call the person's name. I did that for like one and a half months for that bit, hold of bitterness to diffuse. When it diffused, the guy didn't stop doing what he was doing. In fact, he even continued on a higher scale. But you see, I, I didn't feel anything anymore. So you, you are, we are mutually exclusive characters in this picture. So you can do what you want to do, but this is, I was free on the inside. Do you know that when I gained that liberty inside of my heart, there was a release from heaven. That release would have come six months ago, but it was hindered by bitterness. Now the Bible also speaks about idols. An idol is a misplaced affection. It's a misplaced affection. The scripture we read in the book of Ezekiel chapter 14 was a case of people having idols in their heart. You see, the Bible says we should keep our hearts with all diligence because out of it are the what? Issues of life. How many of you were here when I showed us the picture, the portrait, what the heart consists of? Okay. Not, nobody was here. Ah, you people have denied me. Well, according to the study that we did, we were able to see that um, what consists, because in Bible school we are taught that the heart and the spirit are used interchangeably. That's what I taught all the while. Until I did a more critical study of the heart. You know, the Bible says that the man thinketh in his heart, so is he, indicative of the fact that the heart sustains thinking ability. So the mind is part of the heart. You will find Solomon saying in the book of Ecclesiastes, I said in my heart, I would test you with wine. That was a decision. You make decisions from the standpoint of your will. So he was able to say in his heart, I will test you with wine. It means his will was part of his heart. Actually, based on the study that we saw, we did, we saw that the entire soul is part of the heart and the conscience of the spirit is part of the heart. So the soul plus the conscience of the spirit is what forms the heart. You get that? You don't remember when I drew some diagrams and I showed us that in your spirit, as part of your spirit as revealed in scripture, there is a faculty, a place in your spirit that um, is governed by the unction of the Holy One. It's that faculty, that place, that intuitions are born. Okay, let me, let me leave that. Now, you see, in Christ, there is an educational system. All right, that is powered by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we have received the Spirit which is not of this world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we may know the things freely given to us of God. That knowing is not the kind of knowing you stumble into because you studied a book in a library. That knowing is the knowing that comes by an education and the teaching of the Spirit. You see? Now, that knowing is what we call an intuition. The function of intuition is captured in a particular part of your spirit. Okay? Now, the function of fellowship is captured on a particular part on your, of your spirit. Because your spirit 
has intuitive properties. It also has fellowship properties. But your spirit can only function maximally if it is powered by the Holy Ghost. And that's why if somebody is not born again, his spirit is dead. Now, see, dead in that context doesn't mean the spirit. It means it is disconnected from the ultimate life source. There's no vital connection with God. That's why we say an unbeliever is dead. In any form that he lives, he is not alive within the context and description of his creation. You get that? Now, so it's the Holy Ghost that powers your spirit. If it's not working with your spirit, your spirit is dead because he cannot attain to his potential as ordained by God. We saw that the conscience was a faculty that retains the current status of your alignment and holiness. The conscience is that place in your spirit where the laws of God are written. And so when you violate the principles of God, the conscience begins to give you a reading. That reading is actually a manifestation of God's mercy and an indication of the fact that you are still part of God. So it is good to receive that reading. Many times the reading might be a rebuke anyway. You touch something and then you lost your peace. That you even lost your peace means you are born again. <laughs> because if you stop losing your peace, we need to quickly, to be sure, we need to lead you to Christ again. That is to be sure, to be on the safe side. That you are still, you still have something with God. We saw all of that. See, that was when I explained that just like you might buy a cell phone, and when you buy the cell phone and there's no SIM card in it, you cannot connect with any network. If the Holy Ghost is not in your spirit, you cannot connect with God's network, so fellowship cannot be established. You get that? So when He comes in, that's when you realize the full potential of your spirit. We now discovered in that study is that all of the faculties of your mind working with your conscience is what the heart is. It's a very delicate and a strategic, it's an interface organ. Whereas you receive things from the spirit realm with your spirit by the help of the Holy Ghost that then resides. Alright? Many things, you see, the signals you receive from your spirit realm are not you can't put it to human language. It's esoteric. It's a frequency. Sometimes it's light that came upon your spirit. But you see, that which has come upon your spirit, through the operation of the Holy Ghost, in its capacity as the spirit of understanding, now causes that reaction that took place in your spirit to precipitate into your soul. It is in your soul that you can gain understanding of the electrifying power that struck your spirit from the realm of God. Do you get that now? Now, so the heart is vital. And if the heart is not in alignment, you see, it is the interface that takes from the spirit and brings it into the realm where understanding can be captured. Are you with me? It's, it's the interface. It's the interface that links the spirit and brings it into the soul context. And it's when something has come into the soul context that understanding of that thing can be captured. That you can relate with that thing effectively. So if something that came from the realm of God has not yet drifted into your soul, you don't even know what's happening. And it's risky sometimes in spiritual things for you not to have the knowledge of the things that are taking place. Are you with me? Can you see that outside of the heart, the, fac the faculty, the organ of the heart, you have no basis of even understanding something that came from the realm of God. That's number one. Then outside of the heart, the faculty of the heart and its potential, you have no capacity of responding to that which came from God's realm. You want to respond. It must be concocted in the heart because before it can be passed out through that in interface into the realm of God. The heart is like an aerodrome. It's like an airport. If something, if, if the plane comes from above, it needs an airport to land. That's how the heart is. Very vital. And if you are going to understand kingdom activity and the way God operates, 
and the way and what God wants to bring us into, you must know that the heart is a prime organ of God's dealing. His state, his character, his disposition, his attitude will determine to a great extent how much progress you make in the realm of God. Now, in our study of the Bible, we have done this one before. We saw 13 postures that the heart can sustain all through scripture. I think we need to revive those some old tapes. Amen. Because as if what I'm saying is strange. I preach it here. 13 postures. Then I told you from 1 to 13. Because the highest posture in the sequence is the 13th posture. Okay, let's leave that. Now, how many of you have had this experience? I don't know whether you did. When, when I finished my assignment on campus, my heart left there. Did it happen to you? Ha, okay. It happened to you. Your heart left. That's what we call... <laughs> please, uh, it's not a theological name. It's me that is giving it. <laughs> okay, in context, in, I don't know how to put it to be accurate. Okay, I, I'm going to be very liberal. Please don't judge it. If you study your Bible, there is something we call the rapturable spirit. If you finish your assignment on earth, that's how you will feel. So you will be in limbo. That's where Paul was when he said, I can go if I want to go. Well, but it's more profitable for you guys for me to be here. So I will now uncover another kingdom assignment. That assignment is not his own. No. He just wants to be around, strengthening you guys and doing all of that. So he can actually decide to stay when he's in that limbo position. You will not... Somebody brings... Somebody comes back in that limbo position. Somebody now comes from France and says, Hey, I brought diamond. <laughs> you have to pray for him all night. <laughs> that he still has something that ties him to this world. Because you, there's nothing left. Just like you felt... There was no more connection that you had with that place that you finished an assignment and you detached. That detachment is what, is, what I call, not it's called, the rapturable spirit. That means you have no reason to go back anymore. Except you choose that maybe, maybe because Quado is there. All right. So it will be by choice, no longer by instruction and commandment. See, we saw all of that now. Ah. Now, among these 13 postures that your heart can sustain, only three of them are accurate. A broken, a contrite heart. We did all that. I don't want to go into that. That's not why I'm here. We did all that. But you see, if you are going to progress in this life, this spirit life that we are talking about, your birth was supernatural and your life in God must be supernatural. If you are going to progress in it, then you must have capacity to discern the state of your heart. The Bible says that the broken and the contrite heart, God doesn't have the ability to despise it. When he sees such a heart, he's drawn to it. That means we, if we, this art, if we perfect it, we can actually have the ability to move the hand of God. But see, prayer is established on a foundation. And the foundation of which we speak is the what? Attitude of the heart. So it is a healthy Christian culture for Christians that want to advance with God into his death to run frequent heart checks. So that's the only way you will not veer off. Because there, there's this possibility of veering off. You know, when you came for the last conference, you were, you were talking about people using the anointing of God, accurate people that were called of God, now doing demonic things, touching demonic things and trying to get the support from the kingdom of darkness. That is where we are right now. 
It's just like Saul that was sincerely anointed of God, but he came to a point where what he received from God was corrupt. Now started consulting mediums and things like that. Now, the point is this. How did he... What kind of journey was that? That made him end up with a necromancer. When you don't run frequent heart checks, you may not understand that the devil has the capacity to break into your field and you not know about it. And he plants a philosophy, he plants a thought, he plants something. And then that's why the Bible... Okay. That's why, that brings me to the second point. After you... The first point is what? We need to run frequent heart checks. Because there are many things that are already in your heart which you do not have knowledge of. It has not yet... Understanding of that which is operating in your heart has not yet moved into that point where you can have knowledge of it. But it's right there. And when God looks at you, He knows that you cannot pull through the next five years. Because that reality has already defined your boundary. You know, in the Hebrew, that word, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. With the same word translated issue, there is the same word translated boundary. The boundaries of life. So actually God can see something growing in your heart and he knows that you cannot survive the next five years. And because he has tried once and again to get you to deal with it and you refuse to deal with it, it means you regard it. You know, the Bible says if we regard iniquity, not commit to, you regard it. You protect it like your child, like a baby. And you have decided to regard that thing that is upon your heart over and above that which God is bringing you into. You are not ready to lose that which has grown like a cancer upon your heart. What God does is that he allows you then he goes and begins to walk upon somebody else. Because he knows that in five years' time, because of that which is going in your heart, your boundary will not go beyond five years. So he goes and he begins to walk on somebody. He's still ministering to you to be rounding up, sharp, but he's walking on the person. <laughs> that will take... See, the truth is this. It's not God's will for several people that are going to be put out of business. As far as frontline kingdom administration is concerned... It wasn't God's will and it's not God's will for them to be put out of business. But the truth of the matter is that, see, there's a state of heart that has been sustained that has defined a certain boundary. It cannot go beyond. And that's why we need to pray consistently. So that such a situation that will um, measure out a boundary to us will not, will not be our portion. Hallelujah. Now, so there's hard check business. Use the very words that David used in those scriptures. In scriptures like um, Psalms 26 verse 2. Use those kind of words. Who has Psalms 26 verse 2? We have not gone into... I think maybe for this month we'll just do this heart, the heart business. Then, because I want us to do some practicals eventually, but we can't do those practicals this time. Okay? Now, in the practicals, I will teach you how to... Where I know you know the types of prayer, but we'll, because we, are, we call the, the team of the conference is basic prayer lessons. We are going to assume that we don't know anything. Then, if you are going to pray a prayer of petition, there are a few things you need to know as to how to configure it. Hmm? You know, in prayer, most of the time, we leave the responsibility to God. Yeah. Give me a job. Why would God want to give you a job? It may not be in his interest for him to give you a job. Like Anna was praying, give me a child. Why? It may not be in God's interest to give you a child. Because you have forgotten the fundamental principle of prayer. Prayer is a tool in the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer facilitates that agenda. And that's why prayer must be in the context of God's will. And that's not big to know. It's just that 
even my personal needs, I, I need to configure it into God's context. You get? That's what Anna did. Okay, you need a, somebody to be a priest for you. All right, give me a child now. I'll give you. So my petition is clogged into a kingdom need that goes over and above my own personal need. That's how to get. If you strike on it, God will respond. He will respond. But we have not come into that. We'll do all those technologies and all of that. So that when you stand and you are about to pray, you know how the realm is. And from the standpoint of your heart, you know you have an answer now. We'll do all of that. But we don't have time this month to finish that. Uh, who has Psalm 26, verse 2? What does it say? Now use those same words. Cross-examine me, O Lord. Yep. And see that this is so. And see. Yes. Test my motives and affections. No, is that King James Version? No, I don't do all those translations. Somebody have. Ex- examine me, O Lord. And prove me. And prove me. Try my reins. Try my reins. My thought patterns. And my heart. Put them on that chair. He does that regularly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not confused as to why it is David that had this culture. Because he was a worshipper. And you know you can't... Yes, that's why he had this culture. He knew what it would take to access God. To make his voice to be heard on high. He knew what it would take. Now it's just like when you... I don't know. Uh, every car that is has a manufacturing date that is 2000 and above. It has an appendage for a handheld motor computer to be connected to it. It has such a computer appendage. So that when you drive it into the workshop, they can just connect the computer and then the guy will read the handheld and say, well, your alternator is about to die. So that the alternator won't die before we find out. <laughs> okay? That's how it is. The alternator doesn't need to die before you find out that, hey man, I need to make plans for an alternator. And if you do that hard check regularly, you will have information, strategic information that will actually advance your work with God. It was during her check exercises that I discovered how to apply that scripture. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Now there was a time like that some people felt that, okay. Because somehow I was growing in the teaching ministry. And they felt if I come to a place and teach and I leave, the people don't want to hear them anymore. People will now be looking for where I will preach next. So those guys now felt, uh, Elijah knows what I'm talking about. The guys now felt, I was still in the show. Meanwhile, I, was, I didn't know there was a show. <laughs> then one of them, felt he was, it was a calling, an instruction from God to make sure that he runs me down. Because he, I was just stealing the show. Well, I eventually found out there was a damsel in the context that he wanted some affinity with, which I was not aware of. And uh, the damsel was one of the people that felt influenced by the teachings that came and wanted to be instructed for that. So I, it was a treacherous ground that the Lord led me to walk those days. And this guy felt it was a calling from the Lord to make sure that I'm put out of business. Then he came by word of prophecy. He had a briefcase. Now, the guy actually has a way of making an appearance, actually. <laughs> After the service, uh, the preaching had gone forth and there were... They, they took offering and announcement. He now prophesied from the background. 
And I saw Israel scattered upon the mountains. Like sheep without shepherd. Then he now took his, his briefcase and uh, we know we have seen all kinds of <laughs> Hallelujah. At first the thing was getting to me. But I learned how to take my cares to God after the first experience I had. So I took my care. And I told God, I want a fight. That's what I want. You see, I may not appear strong, but I think the last time I checked, it was long ago, I, I won. So, <laughs> and I said, well, I want a fight. Then God said, well, you can have your fight. No problem. But after your fight, these are the number of years of wilderness <laughs> journey that you are going to have to walk because of that fight that you insisted upon. Then I discovered that it was easier for me to deal with the need to fight from inside. The impl- it will be easier for me. The implications will be better if it's dealt with where. Now, see, in your heart check exercises, you must have the ability to show God your wounds. I know that mo- you, are, you are so religious, you have never gone to God and say, I want to kill. No, you don't get hurt. You are just, okay, just everywhere. Bless you everywhere. No. Me, I'm, I'm real. <laughs> just, me, I want to kill now. Hallelujah. In fact, it was so bad that I went to pray one day and while I was praying, God says, see, I just had to inform you beforehand, you know. When you get down from here, you will see people that are gossiping you. So I just, because God knows my problem, I wanted to fight. So, you know that to identify with me in my state. You know, I said, see, they are talking about you. So, no now, no now. <laughs> That's how I left the mountain and I came down. And I came into the midst of some brethren. And they, they now stopped talking. So I now called one of them and said, You people have been talking about me. You said this, you said that, you said this. The few things that you told me on the mountain top. So I now left. So he now went to the rest and said, Oh boy. This guy has been to hear this. This guy has been to hear the thing while they talk. Hallelujah. I desperately wanted a fight. I wanted to create something so that people will know that this man, eh, he can do something. That's what I wanted. But he said, you can have your fight, but it's going to influence a lot of variables. Just like a lady like that, moving with one boy, moving. I told her that you are about to get pregnant and it is going to influence many things. But she didn't hear me. And then when she now got pregnant and she came to me that she's pregnant, I said, well, there's no abortion. Because if you commit an abortion, this is the window that is open. I have to tell her, your destiny is still in view, but it will be more difficult to fulfill it. And one of the first few things you need to get acquainted with is that it will be more difficult for you to get married. So focus on God's mission for your life and leave those ones. Ah! I said, you know I told you before. It could have been avoided. You can avoid some stuff when it's still wet. Now, so the second thing you must understand in heart check is the ability to show your wounds to Jesus. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, as I always drum here, what did he do? In order to convince Thomas, he showed him his wounds. Can you carry your wound to God and say, Hi! That woman that I've been looking at, I've been looking at that woman in the night. Even when I sleep, I see her. Hey, can you report yourself to God and show Him your? 
Who told, if you are mighty in the prophetic, there are sometimes the devil will give you pictures to see too. You don't know. You have a screen inside. He will put some tape for you to see. And if you don't know how to go to God and say, see my wound. And if you lose your virtue of sincerity, you cannot advance far. Now, the reason why we are doing this hard check stuff is because many of our brethren have gotten involved with the demonic realm. So we need to go back to the basics to bring us back into alignment again. This need, this emphasis is needful now because of the nature of the season. Traveled around lately and we started hearing news, not from people that lie, from old people about some of the people we celebrate. <laughs> I say, I think we need to sit down and check again. Show him your wounds. Tell him how you feel. If you feel like slaying somebody, tell him. The comfort that he will bring into your heart is commensurate to that which you can tell him you feel. Involve him. Report yourself. Say, there's something happening. And show him your wounds. Do that regularly. When you get hit by something, hit by an influence, and it's eating your soul up, go to him. And that must be a frequent part, frequent exercise in your mind. Now let's move from here. Let's make some progress. Second thing I want us to see quickly. It's in Psalms 51 verse 6. Are you with me? I say submit to God's search regularly. Second point, show Jesus your wounds. Third point, make Jesus your first audience. And stop there. Make him what? Your first audience. Make him the person that you want to see something about your life first before the congregation. Congregation does not know you. Or make him your first audience. And be conscious of the fact that he is your real audience. Amen. Then in Psalms 51 verse 6. Who is there? Psalms 51 verse 6. In the second major point in the heart check exercise. Behold. Behold. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, uh -huh. thou shalt make me to know wisdom. My emphasis is the uh, part A of that verse. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. You see, your heart needs a filter. A filter from whence you judge all things. When a thought begins to precipitate in your heart, you must have a filter in your heart to judge that thought. What kind of thought is it? When a desire begins to rise up in your heart, you must have a filter, a reference point from whence judgment can be conducted. And that's why the Bible says, Thy word I've hidden in thy heart that I might not sin against thee. You must know how to hide God's word in your heart. And to make it a filter with which you judge the activities and not find expression on the heart. It is only a man that has truth in his inward parts that can identify lust. A man that doesn't have any reference in his heart sees lust as an opportunity. <laughs> he can't identify it because there is no reference point in his heart, no filter. No point from whence he can judge the activities that go on inside. Now, because of the need for us to have truth in the inward part, 
We need to find out how to hide the word of God in your heart. Are you with me? How? Just basic prayer lessons. Basic. How do you hide the word of God in your heart? The first thing you must understand, okay. Let's go to the how. Okay, turn with me to First Timothy. How to hide the word of God. It must be hidden there. The devil has gone ahead, he has changed the price tag so that there will be no reference left in our generation. Nothing to look upon to set a standard from. Your bearing from, your coordinates from. So that we are living in a world of limbo. Ministry has changed so many times, emphasis has changed so many times, we don't even know where God is going. And now, all people know about the prophetic ministry is your phone number is 0805446. Made a mess of things. I'm not saying don't call 080. I've not had any number given to me before. I pray I have one anyway. But I know that if, just, in, just because I call somebody's phone number and it's accurate doesn't mean that the kingdom of God has advanced. The prophet has mighty powers. Now the church needs to draw from for effective advancement to take place. We have not seen so much of that kind of ministry because of the fact that a lot of people <laughs> have not seen the, the big picture. We have not seen the big picture. And what God wants to do right now is to raise a generation that will take responsibility for kingdom things. It's not just one man rising. So the five court ministry will have to do play their role, which is the role of using the insight and the access that they have based on their various offices and skills to bring the entire body in regions into things. That's not zero a zero. That is skill. That's 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 bigger than a man. And at the end of the day, God might even use it to do all of that, and nobody even knows that you were the one that opened the door until we are sent to heaven and God now says, It was actually Babs that opened that door. You guys were basking in it and through it you bought jet, bought this and <laughs> the man that opened the door. God will open our eyes to see the greater picture. What did I say we should open? First Timothy. We need to know how to hide the word of God. Uh -huh. We need a reference point. A filter. A filter. Okay. Hallelujah. Now help me look for a scripture. The scripture, the scripture is not in my script. But I need it now. Okay. First Timothy 4. I was looking in chapter 3. Now, this is a senior apostle speaking to the apostle of another generation. Showing him the things that are important so that he will not spend his youthful years beating about the bush in ministry. Alright? So these are words of wisdom. Bringing into focus the real things that matter. Now, in the book of First Timothy chapter 4, beginning from verse 13, say till I come. Give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine. To what? Reading. To exhortation and to what? Doctrine. Why? He said, neglect not the gift of God that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy. 
with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He said, Meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, so in a day of perversion, in a day where men are striving so hard to make darkness look like light, this man, through experience and stature and maturity in the things of the Spirit, is trying to bring his son counsel. He said, all right, till I come. It will take long, but preoccupy yourself with these things. Meanwhile, before he came to this point where he told the guy what to preoccupy himself with, he had already told him the things that he should never be involved with. He said, give yourself to reading. Now, the first thing we must know about hiding the word of God in your heart is reading. This reading we are talking about is not the type you do. The type you do that you take the Bible and you read. Just read, just read, just read. You read to yourself. No, that's not what we are talking about. This reading here is the kind of reading that the Utopian eunuch did when he was leaving Jerusalem. That type, you read it loud. Oh. Have you ever done that? Did you do it regularly. Take the scriptures and you read it loud to your hearing. And if somebody is within the vicinity, let the person hear too. The juice of that word precipitates inside. You are hiding something. I'm talking about a man with a signet on a balcony in the morning. Just reading Isaiah. <laughs> He's reading to your hearing so that you hear it with your ears. That's what he means by reading. He said, say you need to do something conscious to be under the spell of the scriptures. Because the time will come where men will no longer want any kind of doctrine that is sound. Any kind of doctrine that will bring the authority of God on them. They will like liberty to break themselves from the yoke of God's body. That time will come. And they will do it so much that you will think that that is what it's all about. But you must have a way of charming yourself with this philosophy. And one of the ways is that you give yourself to, to read it. You read it out loud so that you can hear it. You are hiding something. And when the Holy Spirit wants to quicken those words back to you, you will use your voice to quicken it back. Because you use your voice to hide it. Now, a man that does, has not hidden anything in his heart, it will be difficult for the Holy Spirit to inspire him. Because he doesn't have substance in the shelf. Inspiration will be difficult. Amen. Are you ready? Do you know that that thing we say, when, they, when we say, okay, the Holy Spirit laid the scripture on my heart. You know, we say those things. You have experienced that before. Hey, let me see your hand. If the Holy Spirit has ever, okay. Now, that scripture he laid on your heart was in your heart. It was hidden there. He just took it out of the shelf and then said, this is the voice of God to you. Now, if you didn't take any effort to hide something there, you will have little inspiration in your life. But you don't believe me. If somebody just gives his life to Christ and he, he doesn't know anything, he has not been in the corridors of the Bible before, it's difficult for the Holy Spirit to inspire him. Nothing is in his heart. And that's why when people prophesy, you know if they have hidden anything. Because prophecy is actually God bringing what a man has hidden in his heart, aligning it, bringing his mind through. It's inspiration. Every gift that thrives on inspiration feeds on what is on the shelf. When you hear a man prophesy, you know how much substance he has on the shelf. Are you still with me? Give yourself to what? So the average person is shallow because he doesn't have anything hidden in his hand. Just shallow, just walking around, making noise. Hide something. Take it. On the... Have you ever been to Israel before? You see these priests with cap and long beard, and they are reading the Torah loud. Where do you think that? 
it's a custom among spiritual people to do that kind of reading. The guy will be doing the reading if you like jam him, doesn't Oh, but I like that guy. <laughs> he's just he's all by himself. He doesn't care how you perceive him. He's just doing his own thing. That's why they, <laughs> these new age guys they hate Christians and Jews because these guys do not just want to accept any other thing. That's why the Jews were able to keep their culture after how many years? Is it two thousand years? From their land and then they brought them back and the sociological one that took place they still had their native language and their culture just emerged by bringing them back the thing just they gave themselves to it they were among nations in germany uh, atheist nations they still maintained their culture how did they do that say till i come you say i'm not going to be with you i'm not going to be supervising you for a long time but this is going to be your pastime activity give yourself to me. Now we're in Ife. So my mother-in-law gave me her iPad and I clicked the scripture. Me and my people, Grace, my wife, were there. So I began to read. And as I was reading, the thing was becoming sweet. Have you experienced that before? Yeah. You will not know that there is that kind of sweetness if you were reading to yourself without saying it out. Say it out. To become sweet. That is the honey with which God is packaging it to hide it. That sweetness that you felt is, is, is packaging those things so high. In the fullness of time, when that word becomes a strategy that you need, the Holy Spirit picks it up and hands it over to you. That's how it works. He said, till I come, give yourself to... Read. Second. What's the second thing you mentioned there? To exaltation. Give yourself to reading and give yourself to exaltation. Now what exactly is this exaltation thing? You see, exaltation tries on, on an inspiration. Now if the Holy Spirit has laid something on your heart, come. And that thing is burning. You know what I'm talking about? You lay something on your heart and the thing is burning. The fact that the thing is burning means that the life of that which was laid on your heart is still active. That's what it means when you still you feel the impact of that which has been laid on your heart. Okay? And then you now begin to share it. A time comes when that which is burning on your heart will influence the way you share it. You will not be sharing it with your natural ability. You will be sharing it with the power of that implant. Those are the times where you speak accurately. Those are the times where you communicate precisely. And you understand what I'm talking about? That ability to communicate by the influence of the Spirit, that which has been laid on your heart is what exhortation is. So he said, give yourself to reading, and then give yourself to exhortation. Because as you are saying it and communicating it to that person, it's being planted and written on your heart. It becomes yours. So when he lays it on your heart, endeavor to share it with somebody else, then it becomes yours. It's, it's sown to your heart. And it's as much a part of you as your own beating heart. Give yourself to reading, give yourself to exhortation. When last did you come out of your room on campus and you visited, there was something laid on your heart and you were looking for who to share it with? I don't know, there's an attitude we had as Christians some time ago which is not popular. Because these are the tricks, these are the things that we need to do to understand, to enjoy the excitement that is in Christ. You don't do exhortation stuff, you don't share things that God lays upon your spirit. How? Oh, how is your Christian life exciting for God's sake? Just as you're sharing it, as if the bomb is detonating, it's detonating. Some freshness is coming, some freshness is coming. It's as if you are being healed. God reaches into the depth of your being, begins to work things out. You leave that place so fulfilled, so wonderful. You know, one of our sisters on matriculation day in Berry State University they now went out for evangelism. So she now sent me a text after the exercise and said, Wow! That they are feeling like the Ethiopian you knock now. Because 
They just went for exhortation. Just to say the things that the Holy Spirit has put upon their spirit. He, he, he kept them captive until they uttered it. And while they uttered it, they found liberty. See, you may, not, you may think that nothing you are saying is you are, you are saying it for the person. No. That's the way it is for you. As you are saying it, the profit that is in that thing which was laid upon your heart begins to come to you. By the power of God breaking out upon your spirit and that which you are saying becomes yours. When last did you receive something and you went to share it? A scripture was laid and understanding came to you and you just felt, my God, exhortation. We need people. People that can think God's thoughts and speak God's words through their vocal cords again. We need people. I was telling my wife yesterday night, I scrolled through Guidian on my phone. I said the last time there was any good news was when we won Nations Cup. Since that time till now. <laughs> there, has, there has not been one good news on Guidian. Now, the name of the newspaper is called Guidian. It's supposed to be guiding us. But it's obvious. The direction of guidance is quite obvious now. Well, it's because people that are supposed to be exalting are quiet. So we have bad news everywhere. And what God lays upon the heart of people, they don't have it. They are not motivated to share it. One of the things that depicts the people in a kingdom community is that in the kingdom community, there's always exhortation. Yes, there's always exhortation. It's one of the signs of an accurate prophetic camp. There's always exhortation. And notice that Paul said that we should give room for exhortation. He said we should give room for prophecy. We should not despise prophesying. Those are the things that should be found in a kingdom team. Because when you have given that exhortation, the things that you actually have said have been written upon your heart by the ink of the Holy Ghost. It's yours. And when you need those words, the Holy Spirit will quicken back to you. Because you were willing to give it. You, didn't know, you thought you had given it off. No, you actually have received it. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then finally, the one that you know, give yourself to doctrine. That's Bible study. The one you do. Check your concordance and all those things and do all that kind of study. And then, you know, some little, little scriptures. The Holy Spirit hides some quantum of His presence in those scriptures. And as you stumble upon it and you trace it to another one, to another one, then something explodes. And that explosion, <laughs> you know, that's, that's where I walk. That's my office. <laughs> I make those little, little bombs. <laughs> Boom. If you, can, if you can see me in my library, in the spirit, you'll be seeing those kind of scientists that they're showing films with two glass bubbles that things are blowing in the lab. <laughs> my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have a long way to take you people. We just started out and it's a good start. But I will not advance, I will not proceed. Because the subsequent issues that we need to raise will take a lot of Bible reading. Uh, like uh, the day Solomon dedicated the temple, I would like us to profile all the utterances he made. But meanwhile, the Bible says this was his posture. And if you check that prayer, he had his hands lifted up like this, and he was praying it. So we'll start with this posture. And that's where we are going to start. We'll profile it, and then we'll go to Esther. We'll profile them. Then we'll go to people that, influential prayer people, Abraham, Anna, people that got God's attention. We'll profile them. Then we'll be able to explain a few things. Then we'll now see the list of the most influential 
prayer people in the Bible. Three names were mentioned in the book of Job. And then we'll have to study their lives to find out what made them influential. Now this is where I got it from. Ezekiel chapter 14. So it's a long study and I will not want to get in the way of of my friends that are supposed to be doing one or two things. I came down here basically by instruction. I, a day before my coming here, I did not know I'd be coming, but it's an instruction. I believe that uh, there's something, 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 there's something in the heart of God, which we'll find out before the evening session. Amen. Um, Ezekiel, let me show you that. Then I say something. Then we'll do something. And then we'll bring this session to a close. Amen. I would mean Ezekiel chapter 14. I want to read from verse 13. It says, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff upon it, and will break the staff of bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut it off. Will cut off man and beast from it. 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Say the Lord. So the names of three influential intercessors were captured. Now these guys, they are in a, a specific category in spiritual influence. Then a category. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now, so we'll find out why their names got here. And then it will surprise you that Abraham's name is not here. And why Abraham didn't make this list. Just to put some things in place. And then when we have done all of this, then we'll now do some practical. Do some practicals. And we need to get results and come back with the results and discuss the results. Some practicals. Alright? Finally, before I close. Can you clap with one hand? You can't clap with one hand. Because you can't clap with one hand, you need the support of the other hand. For spiritual activity, there is a compatibility that must be achieved within, with your heart and mouth. You see, it is possible for your mind to be saying something and your heart is not in alignment. You are not making any progress, actually. The Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The heart that has believing ability. It's upon the heart that the Holy Spirit comes to furnish the substance of the spiritual thing. Through the activity of Christ, God can bring a reality upon your heart. Alright? And when that reality is brought upon your heart, your heart has the capacity and the ability to believe. Now, when you believe a reality that was furnished upon your heart by the Holy Spirit, what happens is, that which I have believed has become real in the spirit realm. Because the Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Your believing makes you right with God. Your believing brings you into alignment with God. Right? And that which you were manufacturing through your prayer is real. And the Holy Spirit comes to furnish a substance as witness. So you use the eyes of the spirit to see into the spirit realm. And the eyes that you use is the strength of the witness that is furnished upon your spirit as proof, as substance. 
Now, that spiritual thing has become real. But if you are going to create passage for it to come into this realm, then your mouth must go to work. The mouth is that instrument. It's a potter. Apart from talk, talk and gossip and curses, which we normally apply it for, we must understand its real spiritual purpose and context. And that's why a woman will never attain to her full potential until she understands the true use of her tongue. Because, because of the inclination of femininity, the devil has gained the advantage of the use of the tongue for wrong things. And if by discipline, by mentoring, by training, a woman can be brought to a point where she can use her mouth effectively. She is one of the most powerful tools that you have ever seen. See, anything that the devil is doing, just do the opposite. That's what was ordained. Woman talk, talk, gossip. When two of them, they, when they describe your head, the back, that the alignment. Hey! Because there is another use for the tongue. <laughs> and if she's brought into it, she has so much power. But I've seen seemingly weak women here that were confronted with impossible situations. Even the type that me I will run from. I don't know why they sustained. I don't know how they sustained. But they sustained. And somehow we saw changes find expression. And the women I'm talking about are the people that you just look at for at face value and you know this can go too far. <laughs> and they proved everybody wrong. When they were taught how to use their tongue, even the vilest of men changed. I think I have some testimonies to take to heaven, actually. Say, Lord, we saw this. It took place. I found out that the least, that's where I got that my theory from, that the least among us can be mm. as strong as David. I know it is scripture. But me, I saw it happen. That the potential of the man that we call least, if we can even unravel it, our perspective of such a man will change. There must be an alignment between your heart and your mouth. And that's why when you pray, don't pray, don't pray unconsciously. That you are not conscious. Say, uh, Baba, and then the mind is in a current. You are... <laughs> <laughs> you are not in alignment because a house that is divided against itself shall not stand. You do it consciously. Now, many of you come for services here and we lift a worship song and then you just sing because they are lifting it. You, you don't understand. Your heart must go first. And then your mouth will follow to give support to your heart that you can make a sound in the spirit realm. And your voice now goes on high. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There has to be confession, there has to be utterance. But the utterance does not begin from the mouth. The utterance precipitates from the heart as incense, born out of an alignment with our Father, the Father of all spirits. Then he, Amma Mama, is so powerful. If you can understand how it was from the engine room. You will not allow your heart to stray when you pray. Can we do practical for 15 minutes before we pray? You see, you may not know. But the reason why we are like instruments, this one is personal anyway, I don't know whether it's your experience, but I found out that instruments help me align quicker, more easily. And David understood better there was music booming everywhere. Music of worship. How many of you have... God began to teach me about the modern day witchcraft. That's, we will talk about that later. Not now. The modern day witchcraft. That was the subject of my, of my fellowship with God last week. Now, you see, help me. No, Fred, you help me. See, once the heart, music rendered to God in worship, 
helps the heart, makes it easier for you to surrender. It makes it easier for you to surrender. When your mouth is brought into conformity with that which is rising from your heart, it becomes powerful. And so a lot of work, most of the work that is done is done to achieve that. Because when there is alignment, you can mount up with wings like eagles, trusting on the power of the Holy Spirit, gaining ascendance from one level to another level, searching into things that are hidden, bringing the things that are hid to light, going to high places, singing high praise, moving from your sound into God's sound. From your vibration into God's vibration. From your prayer into God's prayer. You gain ascendancy. Until you come to that point where you begin to operate by the spirit of faith. Because when you operate by the spirit of faith, you are saying what God is saying. For the Bible says, we have in the spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith as it is written, He has spoken. God has said, so that we can boldly say. In the operation of the spirit of faith, you say exactly what God is saying. Except you are lying in your heart, you cannot climb to that level to receive words from his mouth and to offer it. Then you become fused with the realm of God like hand and glue. That's when you become God's battle axe. And he can use you to break in pieces the horse and his rider. He didn't say to divide. He said to do what? Break in pieces. I'm wondering how you break in pieces the horse and the rider. To break in pieces man and woman. You know, your work as a pastor becomes so difficult when people now get from 21 years to 28. Damn said, 21 to 28. Hard to pastor. And then you see them elope with a man. The Bible says you can break in pieces man, man and woman. With you! Because at that point you become an, an extension of God. You are fully possessed and under the influence of His power. At that point, what you call witchcraft cannot stand. Alignment. Alignment. Once we achieve it. Hallelujah. You know, for me, a service has not yet begun until we, we can say what God is saying. Yes, we can start our teaching. But the time comes when it's no longer we teaching. It is God talking. When the human element is burnt off. The voice of the immortal begins to speak. You may not know, but you are no longer on earth. We have joined and fused into an assembly in heaven. And our voice is no longer many. It is one. Can we pray this morning? <laughs> 15 minutes of practical. No, we don't have it's now five minutes. Can you write? He come on, mama, mama, sala, mama, mama. He come on, mama, mama, sole, baha, mama, mama. He come on, mala, hapa, mama, mama. Suma, mala, hapa, skebale. Those days, the old prophets, they taught us to close your eyes. I didn't know that what they want was that they wanted us to be more conscious of the inner alignment. I didn't know. I didn't know why. That was why they insisted. Inner alignment. Inside. Move us early, Oh. Your heart is the epicenter. The aerodrome. Say la 
Mama come la samana. Sometimes the utterances that come cannot be put to human language. Don't try to systemize it. Don't try to put it in 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 human thought sequence. It's a perpetual continuum from the belly of God. Uras eva la tamina. Make sure you touch him with the words coming from your heart. Touch his face with those words. Touch his face.
recordings right now. becomes this. When that which is absent becomes present. A time comes when the whole process is powered by the Holy Ghost himself.
and all kinds of things are taking place. How long did we pray? Um, five minutes or... It's about the alignment. You see, something is strong. It's getting stronger. It's getting stronger right now. It's getting stronger. You see it now. Now it's getting stronger. Can you see it now? It's getting stronger. It's getting stronger. It's getting stronger. Now, it's getting stronger. It's getting stronger. Now, what what did we start? We, we started praying. I mean, it's prayer we're praying. But we can make great power available. It's coming stronger again. It's coming stronger. Penetration. 
What is happening is penetration. Penetration. Now, there's another level of penetration. Can we pray for two minutes? There's another level of, of penetration. There's another level. That level is coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming now. It's coming. It's another level of penetration. That is second place. This is a penetration. You see, it's a penetration. It's a penetration. It's a penetration. It's another level of penetration right now. At this level of penetration, God begins to speak. God begins to show signs. God begins to direct the prayer now. That's left your hand. See, He's directing it right now. At, at this level now, prophecy can come forth. You see, because God wants to navigate the boat. you begin to see signs from heaven. Some signs. Some signs. Some signs. Some signs begin to come from heaven. Some signs begin to find expression. Then you know that you are not alone. Then you know that you are not alone. That the words that you have spoken are not your words, but that they were handed out by the Holy Spirit to you. comes in the prayer where you have to keep quiet also. When the activities of God have become strong, you have to keep quiet to see if you can understand the signs, the signals. Show us how to wield this sword. Show us how to wield this power. Show us how to draw from this fountain. Show us. 
ojos. Show us how to dance to the beat of your drama. Show us. Thank you. Then there's a time when you are quiet. Okay, you can play. This is the volume. Just one. Then the signs that he has shot into your heart. He begins to amplify them and to cause the eyes of your understanding to become enlightened. The spirit of wisdom and of revelation goes to work. Knowledge about things that you have never learned begins to come to you. Then he takes you to high places. You lift up your right hand. We want to pray the prayer that Moses prayed. Show me your glory. <laughs> Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Let it come out of the depth of your heart. Show me your glory. saw you that he will hear us and he will answer. Show me your glory. I want to know your glory. The hidden, your hidden chambers of light. The place wherein light dwells. Show me your glory. We have separated ourselves unto you that we might serve your kingdom. Lord, but we have a limitation because you have said that we know not what to pray as we ought. And now we ask that your spirit will help our infirmity. Take us, O Holy Ghost, to that place. Take us past the gates that we might come into the dwelling of life. close, just locate your seat and sit down. You can be standing on one spot and the Holy Spirit will take you. There's great power. The Lord calls us calls us to prayer. Hallelujah. You can open your eyes. I just want to ask a question before we round up. How many of you saw the angel that came when we asked God for his glory? You saw the angel that came. Okay. 
because he will always answer. Come. One person saw the angel. Anybody else saw the angel that came here? You stand here. No, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> you see, the reason why the Holy Spirit came, He took us from the natural, is because He brought us to the throne. And we came there corporately. This, the venue of this meeting changed, was transported somewhere else. We came into a different environment. Then he gave us the privilege to talk to the king. He, but the Holy Spirit knows that with your own wisdom, you cannot talk right. So he, do, he, he will do away with our infirmity. And then the utterances that will come, that will speak, will precipitate in our hearts first. That means he will give us what to say. Then when we ask him for that which the Holy Spirit has given us, even if it is that the moon should, should be lost for some days, and it has something to do with God's program, and we have designed it by the Spirit's revelation, it will come to pass. Okay? Now, you saw the angel. Uh, please give us an account of what you saw. While the worship was going on, you know what the prayer was going on? I saw a cloud. It was a cloud. Then I saw someone sat upon a lion. The lion was rolling, rolling. Then the head was white. Then I heard a voice. I wanted to enter into the spirit of prophecy, but he said, this is not to, this is not, this is not to be spoken out. I, then I, I, kept, I kept silence. Then what, what, I, what I heard him saying was, I am coming to my people not, not as a lamb. I am coming to them as a lion. I am coming to my church as a lion. And then I saw the glory. The glory was just shining from this particular direction where this light is down to the church. Then the picture took off. I was going to stop us in that. When we made that request, and in the realm of God, if a man can be right, and his heart is contrite and is in alignment, even if he asks for something that is not anywhere, God will create it. So you must have an answer. Must have an answer. You see, there are times in your prayer where you wait. Especially when God begins to take over the prayer, He begins to give you signs prayer directions, emphasis. Sometimes you can just release a song into your spirit. And that song is not a human song. It's just a sound. And he wants to just be making that sound. Just be foolish. Because he's the one powering the process from that point. That yeah, yeah, sound that you may claim to be saying is that sound that is making you transport in that realm. That's transportation. You know, when you're on a bike, there's a sound. When there's movement, there's a sound. <laughs> That's transportation sound. And then you're transported into a place. When you get to that place, then there's a shift. The power driving that song in your spirit might go down. And then nothing else comes up. Be quiet. And then something else pops up and it goes on. As long as you can, you can stay. It goes on and on and on and on. Now, I want to say something. What does it mean to be in a hurry in God's presence? To be in a hurry in God's presence is not the time. It's a state of heart. Somebody can be in the place of prayer for two hours, but the person is in the hurry. Because the heart doesn't want to allow God. Maybe God just wants 30 minutes actually. For the guy came and the heart is in a hurry. Because he has not submitted to God 
to allow God to have His way in that prayer time. Now, that state of heart can only take you past a few gates, and then you'll be stuck. And then at the end of the day, you now waste the time that you thought was precious that you could not spare. See that? So being in a hurry is a what? It's a state of heart. Now, when you attend the prayer meeting, just like the name goes, there's a prayer, there's something you want to achieve, alright? And then Pastor Dan now leads us in the prayer meeting. That one is different from the one I'm talking about. This one I'm talking about, you don't have your prayer points. You just want to pray God's prayer. You want to just, if God says, I will sing for two hours, have your way. You are not the one that dictates what happens. You just want to climb into the spirit realm and then do what God wants you to do. That's your personal time of fellowship with God. That's not a prayer time. It's a fellowship time. God determines what happens. You can also have another time where you have needs. You want to spread before God. And all of that. But this time I'm talking about is a time where God determines what happens. You don't have a ready-made agenda so that you will not be in control of the process. And you allow the Holy Spirit liberty. And we begin to move like that. I've seen it more than a thousand times. When we begin to move like that, you can't tell who the Holy Spirit will come on. But he will activate his spirit on a higher tempo in somebody's life other than another person's life. But you in the natural might feel, hey, Larry has gotten it. Indeed, he did. But you see, we are doing something corporate. Alright? Maybe the weapon that Larry received in this corporate prayer is not in, for him alone. He's doing something in connection with all of us where we are. But you see, the way it is playing out in the natural is not really the way it is in the realm. What you are doing, that grace that came upon you was not just for you. It was for everybody. Now, if this man were allowed to prophesy, the prophecy did not come just because it's a prophet. The prophecy, the prophecy will be coming because of all of us. You see? Because when we achieve alignment corporately, there are manifestations, and we should not, trans, we should not interpret those manifestations as individual things, but they must be interpreted as corporate things. I believe that there are times, and that time is not far anymore, we will come for a meeting. And then God will deliberately stop us of a message. So we'll now just say, let's enter the realm. And then when we just enter, it will open up something that will continue for two weeks. For one month. For three days. And the Holy Spirit is just pouring. It will take corporate alignment to do that. That's what we call revival. But this is the technology by which it is received and, re- and, and, and retained and sustained and managed. The Lord will help us. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to take two questions before we break camp. I don't want us to take too much time here. Because of something that a few of us need to do. Immediately after this time out. Two, two questions. Just about prayer. Now, take the mic. Okay, you have a question yourself. Just two questions. Then we'll break up. While you were teaching, you said something about uh, reading. About reading yes. the scriptures. As a means of hiding the word of God in your heart. Yes. yes. Uh, Apart from you reading to yourself, is it possible for you to have maybe an audio Bible being played? No, no, no. You see, you can't clap with no hand. And you can't clap with one hand. Okay? It's not an audio Bible thing we're talking about. I have an audio Bible on my phone. I'm in the book of John now. When I click it, the thing, the guy is an orator, the guy that read it. His voice is sweet. That one is different from what I'm talking about. 
In this one, through your reading, you are drawing your heart into what you are doing. Then the time comes when your reading and your heart are in synchrony. Then you can feel the sweetness of the scriptures that you are reading. The proof that your heart and mouth have come into synchrony is that it begins to sound sweet. begins to really enlighten your eyes. Read it to your hearing. Yes? Alright, please help me. Yeah. So my question is this. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that... Meanwhile, I don't have all the answers anyway, but there are a lot of us here. So yes. if there's a question that I don't have an answer, maybe somebody else will help me. And if we don't have answers, we'll go and ask God and come back after some time. So, go on. So, is it possible that somebody spends six hours praying in tongues and then another person spends one hour? And the person that spends one hour actually gained more than the person that spent six you hours? You know the answer now. So, with the open heart, let's see both of them are both open to God. Uh, you see, I don't think you have understood me very well. You yourself, you don't know your heart. Who can understand his errors? That's the cleanse me from secret faults. It's very possible that somebody can pray for five minutes and enjoy deep fellowship thereafter. And you have prayed for six hours, you are not enjoying the same quality of fellowship. It's just based on alignment. That's all. It's based on alignment. Your heart is open, Abi. You say it's open. But God sees much more than you know about your heart. And that's why we need to do consistent heart checks. Because even when you do not think that anything is wrong with you, you are not seeing through the right lens. Right? So you still need to go for heart checks. And if God should point out something and say, deal with this, you deal with it. And then you keep going. But a prayer is not so much of time. It's much more of how much of yourself you give. Now, I'm not too comfortable when we capture prayer, define prayer with reference to time. Because there were times that I did 18 hours tongues for God's sake. And I did it for three days. And I didn't get anything. Yes. This is how I did it. I was conscious of the number of hours I wanted to pray. That's number one. So that I'll come and use it to preach. So I put clock. Then I pray. Then when I'm tired, I sleep. Then I see how many hours I slept. I subtract. I stand up. There were times that the Holy Spirit filled me, actually. Now, you are not with me. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray 18 hours. Once in a while, you need to do prayer trek. That one is, you are clearing the valve. We have not come to that yet. Prayer trek. You just stretch for 12 hours. Stretch for 6 hours. You need that for spiritual health. Alright? So, but me, I, I was doing it with the wrong motive. My own was to come and shine. And to say I prayed for 18 hours. I eventually succeeded. But it was not profitable. And I had my 18 hours boasting time. I came back to the pulpit and I boasted for a long time with that. But I didn't get anything. But I no longer do that. I no longer go into the closet because I want to come back with time. And just in case, maybe you cannot pray as long as I do. I don't rate you spiritually lower than myself. Because only God knows how much impact we made in the realm. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. To balance that. Nevertheless, as a spiritual man, you must pray long. So, I don't know if I contradicted myself, but I've helped you with the balance. Just in case somebody will leave here and say, Pastor, say, no, you pray long. Meanwhile, it's easier for me now than 10 years ago. Do you understand? 10 years ago, we did it. 
it was necessary. With seven hours, eight hours, seven, like that. All those bad cleansing that we did is adding to where we are now. Just in case you see us and we talk small in the pulpit and <laughs> go and pray your own eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <laughs> go and pray your own eight hours. Wait. In order for you to become used to spirit things and spirit life and to function in the spirit realm, you must have a good investment in tongues. I was studying my father and the Lord, and I was saying, ah, see, so many people around you fell, 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 and you are still standing like this. And when you ask him, he'll laugh. He will not answer. Because he's expecting you to observe what is in his life. Because he, his life is not a secret life. It's there for everybody to see and to read. I saw that he has many years of tongues to his credit. His spirit is strong. That's how he survived the times. I saw a very beautiful lady here yesterday. I saw her going. And I saw that her tank was empty. So I called her and said, Hey, come. I have not seen her today. I said, when last did you fast? He said, in January. Then I said, let me allow her. But the Holy Ghost won't let me. I said, come back. Spend your time consciously <laughs> investing in spirit life now. Because the time will come when you will not be able to do it. If it has become your lifestyle now, you cannot deny it subsequently. And a lot of people don't do that investment. They don't sh- make the shift. It's conscious. You are going to do it consciously. And the devil will know that you want to gain influence without his permission. And he will make it difficult. You will make the job not to come. You will make you suffer. No money. So that you can, your heart can go somewhere else. Hey, man. This pain will drop. Hey, shy. You take your heart to many things. But when you keep pressing, you gain mastery. It will be easy for you to access the realm. And then things will change, actually. And even change in your finances, too. We have seen that. Our life is a derivative of our walk with God. I'm not giving to prosper. That's not why I'm giving. You might be giving to prosper. You're giving tight so that you prosper. That's why you have been giving only 10%. We have left that realm a long time. We are giving because we love Him. If he doesn't give us anything again, we're okay. But somehow he says the sons of Jacob will not serve me again. So I don't know why he said. Because people serve, serve who will in vain. And they serve him faithfully. And he's still in vain. He can decide that. And there's nothing we can do. But he says, no, the sons of Jacob won't serve me. I'm going to be there for them. When they need me, I'll show up. I'll be there in their personal issues. In their life issues. Because they have decided to serve me. Right? Serve him faith. Serve him faith. If you are not faithful in your giving for 10 years, you are not likely to stumble on what the Bible calls harvest. Yeah. Mercy drops will be available, but major... <laughs> you know... <laughs> Let me take this. What we are doing now, we have done it for more than 10 years. What man is say, put L on your back as a learner. Until you have done Bible study for 10 years. Until you have been a prophet for 10 years. That's when you become a prophet. That's when you become an apostle. You have done it for how many years? 10 years. That's your life now. You cannot undo that life. That's what it means. A lot of tongue hours is required. Your brother called me from South Africa. And he was telling me about his flight time. That when they fly, they will now record how many hours they have flown in a chart. And that he needs 1,500 hours or so to fly in Nigeria. I said, how many hours have you done? Then he told me, I forgot, 200 hours. So he needs some more hours. You need tongue hours. Enough tongue hours to <coughs> to make you normal. So for any reason why you pray, whether you pray for six hours and nothing happened, is an investment. 
So let's not also try to find out how much benefit do you draw from it with your mind. Forget about that. Just keep going. It's good for a man to bear his yoke while he's yet young. Because when you become 57, when you move like that, you have back trouble. And this uh, bony kebab cannot straighten it. Because you didn't move 7 hours when you were 21. Now you want to move 7 hours at 54. It will not be natural. Hallelujah. As young people, let's spend our active time gaining tongue hours. Just like the pipe was needs what flight hours. You need a lot of it. And the devil will come to distract you. You bring financial issues, bring all kinds of things, turn people against you. Be focused. Be focused. You know, now it's sweeter for me now. I'm thanking God that He, he pushed me into situations that made me pray. <laughs> it's sweet. Now, I went somewhere and a few weeks ago and I was preaching like came close to a lady that was possessed. Then I touched her. I said, that thing that you ate, vomit it. And the lady vomited. And the people said, a great man has come. No. Tongue hours contributed. You understand that? There was a time when that kind of thing would never happen. Through me. But there was another time when so there's no magic about it. Every one of us must try. And we must understand. Don't leave your heart behind. Go with it. And be conscious of what he drops the science it brings, the direction that comes, it will be a wonderful time. But for the past 10 years, I've had constant communion with God. No break in transmission. I move as a living temple for 10 years, for more than 10 years, no, more than. For more than 10 years, I cannot tell you that I was discouraged once. No. I don't remember it. If there's any scenario, I don't remember it. When you live in alignment and accuracy, circumstances will come, but when the activity inside is heavy, no, it can't get to your heart. It will hit and drop. It will hit and drop. It will hit and drop. If it affects your spirit, then there was little energy. Very. Hallelujah. Finally, I saw one hand. If very. Oh. So, um, you said there is supposed to be a synchrony between your heart and your mouth. Yes, heart and mouth. What if it's just the heart praying? Maybe you don't have time, but there's this burden on your heart. And it's just there. It's just there, but you don't have the time. So, you know, use your lips. And that's also prayer. Your heart talking. Uh, let me press further. Hi. This thing is in this script. It's not now. I won't answer your question now. It's for the future. Don't, I don't want us to lose the sequence. Hallelujah. Because we are going to Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul says, he teaches us how to use the, uh, the armor of God, the weapons of God, and he says, train always. That's how to use the armor. Hmm? Train always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance for all things. That, this is his recipe for using the weapons. So, this you are praying from the heart, or what we call meditative prayer, is part of what we call praying always, with all prayer. So in that all prayer, one of the prayers is meditative prayer. Now, see, in meditative prayer, yes, your mouth may not move, but you are engrossed in the consciousness of the body that is sustained in your heart. 
Okay? That's the kind of prayer we do in the office. Nobody knows we pray in the office. Because we are attending to people. We are signing stuff, stamping stuff. And uh, who is that? Um, Lyadon. Robert Lyadon said, Man, a spiritual man, a prophet, does not need to be weird. When people are coming to sign something, they say, Now, you are actually in the flesh. That's what you are doing. You are in the flesh. We had a nuisance like that on campus. <laughs> when people want to go downstairs, you block the way. And they so, and there was nothing you could tell him to change his ways. Well, he was useful to God for a season. In his holy, but he was useful. <laughs> for a season. But you don't need to be such a person. If I stay with you, my prayers will never disturb you. You will not even know I'm praying. I will not constitute no... So in the office we pray, but we don't pray audibly, we pray meditatively. But there's, there's something that kind of your prayer cannot achieve. What that your prayer does is that it separates you from the environment. It keeps you separated unto God in an active, worldly environment. Give me time. Our golden scripture for this teaching is in Romans chapter 6. And chapter 7. We have not reached it. We are still doing basic lessons. So the basic lessons will take us to Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7. Then I will come to meditative prayer. Meditative prayer. But see, your heart must be in alignment with current spirit emphasis for you to be that kind of sanctuary. So your heart speaks. And because of the speakings of your heart, you are separated from the secular environment. They are stealing blood in the hospital from the blood bank to sell, to make a sermon. You are seeing them, but you are in another world. You are off Federal Medical Center. You are in Federal Men- Medical Center, but you are not off it. Because you are separated onto something else. And that separation is consistent because it's burning from the altar of your heart like a flame every day. We'll, we'll look into that. But there are some things that that prayer cannot achieve. If you want to achieve some other things, you will need to speak for you to find it. There must be a synchrony with your heart and mind. What you are doing, you are clapping with one hand. Alright? You can actually, that one is good. But what it has achieved is separation and willingness. That's where you are. And because of the, the, the willingness, you will be consciousness, you will be conscious of the activity of Christ running on your heart. So that that prayer you could not pray in the office, you will still have to pray it at home. Definitely. The body can be built in both. You must find a place at home subsequently to pray that prayer. You can close from the office and join the prayer meeting and then you are flow, oh, then you feel better. But you must say it when the time comes. Yes. See, uh, You must say it when the time comes. But that's how we keep ourselves separated. More lower. When last were you? I'm on it. Even the day I came here. The day before the day I came here, I was, I was there. You just sit down like this. Eh? Somebody say, no, he allows you to sit very well. Hey, Lego. Now your father bag, now you sit down on top. Your father for village, your father, your grandfather. Now he bad, this bad, now you sit down on top. Then he will speak, your bad. <laughs> but you see, when that altar is burning, eh, you are in Modloe, but you are not. People will not say, this guy, a young man, be this way, woman, talk. You know, go knock her. That's from the back. Oh. <coughs> B- 
the real person that wants to talk has not started. Though. They'll be driving here. Driving. Then that real person that wants to talk, that will talk till you drop. But when the altar is burning, eh? you are separate. You don't feel offended. Because there's something heavy, bigger than the environment taking place inside. That's the life of holiness. It thrives on a burning living altar. It thrives on a living altar. That's how to protect holiness. Don't worry. Uh, Romans, we'll get there. It's part of this. That's how to perfect it. And every day in Molue, the same thing happens. Then you ask, the driver wants to stop, but he will never stop fully. We just match break. Then you find your way. And, and as I shall find your way, you touch somebody. The person will invoke the names of the dead people in the village. But you need a living order. That's how to work it out. Yes, um, finally. Uh, I'm somebody who is given to, when I'm praying, I shout a lot. A time will come where God will take you to a place where you can't shout. Okay, sir. So, um, Wait, so, now let me calm down. Uh, you have only a single barrel. You need to be double. Mm. I used to shout like that on the mountains of Kano. Until I went to Abuja to stay with my sister, she said, Pastor, here, we don't shout. Hey. This place, the people are thinkers. They need the peace. Eh, hey. thinkers. Here, yeah, so, they need the peace. Now, when I'm going, the team wants to come. Better! I, I did that for some time until I found out that God has not gone on a journey. Because he's not on a journey, you can actually talk to him cool. Then I now learned how to pray silently for two hours, three hours, four hours, and then night digit silent. So if I come to a place like this where we have no restrictions, I'm so used to the silent one, Sha. I, I will start until I'm, until I'm energized by the Holy Spirit. I don't change the tempo. Mm. So when I'm taken to the higher level, then the utterance begins to come out. Then when I'm filled, then it... So I, I don't just take off. Like that. And since I started doing that, my voice are normally cracked. Don't even crack again. Mm. Excuse me, uh, you don't understand my question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I I pray very very silent prayers. Oh, okay, you are a double but When I come, for instance, to the tent, mm. and I begin to pray, I just pray in tongues for some time. Then the rest, I just shout. No, for you have but you have me, but shout. Um, the well, Bible says Jesus caused the victory, and his disciples heard him. That's why we we cut this place out for shouting. It's part of it. Okay. So, um, what, what baffles me is that sometimes, me, me too, I feel uncomfortable with the way I shout. No, no, and, and sometimes, because of the level of the maturity of the people that are around me, sometimes it's as if I'm disturbing them. So I, not under, wait, 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 uh, wait. We are different. In this place, shouting is allowed. I'm just saying when you have a neighbor, you are staying in face man, face your compound. And then you now wake up from your door, go to the next door and say, <laughs> now, we have a problem with that. We have a problem with that. I'm saying, please, don't be restricted and don't be restrained. There are times that you cannot have expression until you shout. There are times like that. Even a gentleman like Dan, when that day comes for him, he will shout. I don't know how he will look in the shouting mood anyway, but he, I know he will shout. But some of us shout often, so it will not be strange for you to see that anymore. But you see, there's a time where you, you only feel better inside when you walk. Mommy, 
Have you ever shouted before? You are so gentle. You have shouted in the spirit before. Now you, you don't shout before. You try it more. Uh, she's looking. It's more miru that I'm saying. Have you ever been moved to shout? Yeah. The Holy Spirit will always, even if you are the gentle type, we are warriors, fighters from the beginning. So shouting is part of the uh, When he demands a shout, he needs an expression in that way. All right? And we are prayer people. Please don't be restrained. What, what if you are just shouting like that for hours? It's consistent in your life. I don't know. Keep shouting. Okay. Mm. Keep shouting. Okay, finally, Jerry. Keep shouting. Please shout. Shout. Crying. Give it expression, please. You see, um, uh, what what is like? There's something we call the manifestation of the spirit, right? The manifestation of the word. When the word is manifested, what are the characteristics? When the spirit is manifested, what are the characteristics? Now, when the Bible says that when the seventy return with the message of their apostolic success. Now Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. That was a manifestation of the spirit. Now, we don't know what it means. What exactly was it? How did he do it? Did he shout? I don't know if he shouted, but he rejoiced in the spirit. There is a rejoicing that can be locked into your spirit and is seeking expression. How it expresses itself is based on what is required to give you ventilation inside. Sometimes it might be great joy in the spirit, but the expression is tears. Have you cried before? Like uh, Franca, she, she was crying. If you ask her, why did you cry just now? She may not know and she doesn't need to know. It. It's a manifestation of the spirit's expression. Now, so if you try to bring, make a service too orderly, let's sing him 444. From sacred song and solo. And then the organ is now go. <laughs> if you maintain it on that level, nobody will be healed. It will be a congregation of the dead. You are managing everything, so you don't need the Holy Spirit. And I found out that in services like that, I normally sleep easy, easily. Yes, I'm telling you about. <laughs> I just see myself sleeping. So please, if we go somewhere for some time, you see me sleeping like that. I'm telling you now. <laughs> but there's a place you cannot sleep. Uh-huh. So, let's not try to organize if the expression is crying to God's glory. Release the expression. The, point, the, only, the only thing is that if we have see a, a manifestation that is not the manifestation of the Spirit, we also know. And if you are a babe, we will not tell you this one. But don't be restricted. Okay? The Lord will help us. In Jesus' name. Yes. Praise God. Mm-hmm. So how do you know when you gain alignment? Alignment? Yes. How do you know when you gain the alignment? Ah! You are asking me about the spiritual reality. How do you know when you put on your clothes? Okay, let's say a blind man wears his trouser. How does he know the trouser is on? He feels it. You feel it. The, 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 the proof of life is consciousness. That's the proof of life. And if the spirit life is kicking, there's a consciousness it leaves. It leaves droppings of a consciousness. I follow him. I can't explain it, but I just know that I'm okay. There are no words. You see, English language is too weak. You know. Because there's a sense of life that gives you the indication. Alright? Just like there's a sense of life also that gives you the indication that you are not in alignment. 
feel dryness. All of those things are symptoms of the fact that the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. And you begin to seek refreshing. Seek refreshing. Seek and you struggle on your own. And then maybe you come for a corporate fellowship and then the presence of God breaks over the corporate house. And then through that corporate anointing, that corporate alignment, you received a blessing that came from the corporate boat. And natural dryness was broken. You came into something. So because there are some spiritual problems that can only be solved on a corporate level. Your own personal prayer will not solve it. That's why we need to come together once and again so that those corporate dimensions of blessings can come to us. I can't go into details now. But the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. All of this that we are doing is so that we can have people that can command deliverances unto Jacob. Anywhere you find yourself. And please don't make the mistake of separating the secular from the sacred. Because if, if an evangelist goes to the market, he's an evangelist. And the market can become his crusade ground. But to bring crusade into a market, you need wisdom. And then the wisdom of God will now reveal to you how to do your evangelism in the market. If you are a civil servant, then that is the platform where you will reach most of the people that you get to meet. And God is preparing you for that platform. You take ministry to that platform. So we don't look for pulpits, we look for people. Is your question related to prayer? Give him the microphone. Praise the Lord. I discovered particularly the aspect of gaining alignment. Um, One of the things you will discover is there are no beatings of uh, conviction, of lapses, and you discover you gain an unusual power to do that thing you want to do naturally. While we were praying, you saw when the anointing came on uh, Larry and he just began to take off like a tornado. For that anointing to come on him, alignment was achieved in his heart. You get it? It's inner heart alignment. If you have it, you know you have it. And if you are a preacher in active ministry, that's your ticket. Any day you are not in alignment, you don't have a ministry for the people. You cannot minister life. Because life does not begin with you. Life is in Christ. And you are going to have to align with him for him to flow through you as a vessel. So your heart condition is your ticket. God will help us in the name of Jesus. I hope we have understood it to this level. It's a long journey. We'll, keep, we'll be carrying it gradually. But uh, God will help us. In Jesus' mighty name.